Welcome back to the Snack Walls Podcast. I'm Mike Roberts, your host, and we're here to talk about increasing and maintaining diversity in tech beyond the perks. While companies think they can lure people in with unlimited PTO and dogs in the office, we're here to talk about how you keep them. I want to throw it over to our special guest today. In a few words, can you tell us who you are and what it is that you do? Hi, Mike. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm Lisa Bowman. I'm the Chief Mojo Officer of Marketing Mojo, and we are a brand consultancy. Uh, we're market techs. We build for brands at the intersection of purpose and profit, where good business happens. Nice. So we'll just jump right into it. I'm hearing from some leaders in tech that finding diverse talent is a challenge. What are your thoughts? You know, I don't think there is any shortage of diverse talent out there. Um, I think that people need to understand how to go look for it sometimes because there are oftentimes when a traditional path may not appeal to a certain segment. Um, I know that in my past, having worked for the UPS Foundation and for United Way as an example, one thing that we would really do is look to provide opportunities. Um, specifically for young women of color when it comes to STEM. It traditionally wasn't a career that they would pursue. Sometimes you don't have a role model there that really leads you down that path. And so it may not be something that you think about necessarily. Um, So I don't feel that there is any shortage of diverse talent. I think sometimes you just need to get creative in how you attract that talent to come to you. I like that, getting creative. And I feel like oftentimes, (laughs) This is maybe not as funny to you, but um, I always go to the card of like United Way as a place that people think of first. They think of like, let me donate or let me spend some time with a big organization. And I think it's kind of like the cheat to like getting your hands dirty and actually getting into the community and finding out in your local community, what are some ways that you can engage with like local nonprofits and organizations that are doing good. So nothing against United Way, because I know that they're doing fantastic work and they often partner because they have such big resources on doing the demographics and reporting and things like that, that can facilitate grants actually like happening. But I 100% agree, it's that creativity, it's that idea of getting out there and trying to make something happen and not listening to that narrative, so. Well, and to your point also, you know, not to turn this into a conversation about United Way, but that's part of the beauty of United Way is that they do provide funding at a very local level to the community and to this organization. So while United Way itself may not be doing something particularly with, let's say, young women of color in STEM, they're certainly funding programs through other organizations that do. It may be Boys and Girls Club, it may be something more localized. Um, so certainly I would think that engaging in the community is a great way to attract that talent. Um, going in and talking, helping ki- younger kids think about their career path. That's a great way to start building that pipeline and start changing the narrative for certain segments that may not be thinking about getting into technology or STEM or whatever it is. I know that as a marketer, as a profession, we're struggling a little bit too. Um, marketing to some extent is not necessarily at the top of people's lists for a profession these days. Well, I'd say at any point, right? I don't know that too many kids even know what that is. And so that's a, a really valuable point. Introducing folks at an early phase can help them to see where they want to go and what they might want to do when they grow up. So I know that was the case for, at least for me. So, um, what do you think about the push to remove the requirement for CS degrees as we start thinking about what are tangible ways um, to get people into software engineering roles? Um, do you think that's helpful? I am a big believer in the fact that sometimes practical experience outweighs formal education. And I know that as a leader, um, when I have looked at talent to hire talent, there are times when I have passed over somebody that came to the table with great credentials in lieu of somebody that really brought solid experience to the table. Um, so I, for me, it's really a matter of finding the best candidate. If the education will serve to make them the best candidate, 
then yes, I'm in favor of that. But there's a lot of practical skills, right? There's people that have come from an alternate background that have done the job that maybe have gone through the military that don't have that formal degree yet they know how to do the job. So I think it's a matter of finding the best candidate for the job and that's about the right cultural fit, the right practical experience. Listen, there's a lot of things that I don't have formal education in as a marketer, but I've done the work. So I've learned along the way how to do it. And I think sometimes the school of practicality is the best degree that you can get. Yeah, 1000% agree if that's a thing. So It is a thing. So do you think that an apprenticeship pattern would work for some tech roles? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think going back to my earlier point, sometimes your younger self doesn't necessarily know what you want to be when you grow up, even when you get into the workforce. I had, um, I had given a keynote speech to a group of young female UPSers that were management trainees about career pathing. And one of the slides that I put up had a graph on it that said, you know, here's the way that I thought my career was going to go, right? So um, bottom left corner, straight up to the upper right corner. I thought it was going to be the straight path trajectory. That was my vision. The reality was is that what that chart looked like was a bunch of this. Um, it's not a straight line, right? And so sometimes I think you get into something you don't necessarily know. An apprenticeship is a great way to try something and determine if it's a good fit for you. I, I almost think about it in the same context. And you know, we talked a little bit before about travel. I must think of it as the same context as a cruise. To me, a cruise is a great way to try before you buy, before you make that travel commitment to go spend a week or 10 days somewhere. Um, you get to taste it. It's like the appetizer sampler platter, right? You visit a bunch of different places, try them out and see if it's somewhere that you want to invest more time in. And I look at an apprenticeship exactly the same way. You get some practical skills. You find out if this is a job for you. I think there's a lot of correlations there. I thought you were going to go with the cruise being like all you can eat food. And I was just like, how is she? Where is she going with this? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's that, too. Um, but uh, no, I to me, it's, you know, I, there's a lot of people that I know that have set out on a specific profession including quite frankly, I've got a handful of friends that are attorneys, but when they started practicing law, they actually found that they really didn't enjoy that. And that's a big financial investment in school to make. So I think that there's a great opportunity um, to apprentice, to try a career, to try a functional industry, see if you like it, see if it's a good fit for you. And candidly, maybe that should be a part of the formal educational curriculum that you do do an apprenticeship. Um, before you actually determine a major to make sure that the classes you're taking that education you're investing in in pursuit of that particular role are appropriate and that that's really what you do want to do. Yeah, I think I think you're thinking more of internship, but I get the same like the same point applies that getting that practical experience. I think it's much bigger like in the UK, for example, it's just part of the natural flow from the um, like K through 12. I don't think they call it that there, but like their primary school and then getting people into these career paths is often like it's just as I guess a uh, normal there to go through an apprenticeship than it is to go through the path of, you know, going to a four year university. So I, th I agree. I think more of that should be happening here and whether it's internship or apprenticeship, I think both add a tremendous amount of value for the candidate to be able to determine what's a good fit. Cause you are going to invest a lot of time, energy, and in some cases there could be some money involved, right. In yeah. pursuing certain qualifications for jobs. Like let's say you want to be a doctor. Well, you're going to have to go through, four years of undergrad and at least a couple more years of med school and then some residency time and then like decades of student loans. So you better be sure you know you like it. So oh totally agree. And I know that um Switzerland actually does a big apprenticeship thing too as far as high school. I think it's almost the same. And so I draw a distinction between internship and apprenticeship. 
But when I think about apprenticeship, it's almost the same thing as like vocational school, but you run it sure. parallel with your formal education. So I know they do that in Switzerland. Interestingly enough, I have a 16 year old, she's a sophomore. She is taking business classes in high school as a sophomore. Right now she's taking a business law class. And so I think that the educational system is starting to expose kids to a little bit more of the business curriculum as well to help them see if they can determine a path earlier on or at least steer them in a direction of things that are interesting to them. Yeah. And I'm even seeing more of like entrepreneurship, like beyond just business acumen, really establishing this culture of like being creators and not charting the, you know, the typical path. And instead really thinking about how can you do something you know, super novel and, and do it in a way that you're actually using some structure. So I'm curious I agree. if we bring it back to, so if you've hired diverse candidates, you've gotten them into your organization, what do you think you need to do or what? Good advice would you share with companies that are looking to retain diverse staff? You know, I I don't think that it's necessarily even a matter of retaining diverse staff, right? I think the same thing applies because the more you, and I, I hesitate to use the word segregate, but the more you segregate a diverse staff or treat them differently, um, the more it calls out that there's a difference. So to me, Rule number one in retention is sort of a basic management thing, which is to understand that not everybody wants to be treated the same. Um, you don't treat a male employee and a female employee necessarily the same. You may not treat a more junior and a more tenured employee the same. People are people. And so as a leader, I think you need to find out what makes that person tick, what is going to motivate them, and that's going to be different for everybody. So understanding who's working for you, building that relationship. You don't necessarily have to be besties at work, right? But you should have some insight, some emotional intelligence about the people that work for you, what their life is like, what's happening in their world, so that you can treat them appropriately. Everybody should be treated appropriately, but I guess it's a matter of treating people differently based on what motivates them, what their background is. and. You know, the other thing I would say to the point of diversity, too, is particularly right now with everything that's going on in the social equity space, sometimes I think we lose sight just a little bit of the fact that diversity is a broader than race and ethnicity. It also incorporates the variety of perspectives, your experiences, sort of where you come from and who you are. And right now we have got as a country clearly some very big racial issues that we need to deal with um, that have been ignored and pushed in the corner for far too long. And those are front and center. And I appreciate that and support that 110%. But I think when we look at the true definition of diversity, we sometimes need to remember um, that it's a, a broader definition than sometimes we look at it. Yeah, I mean, I like to use um, women I like to call out specifically Black and Latinx because I don't see enough representation in software there, um, LGBTQ. And often I talk about neurodiverse and sometimes people will ask me, what does that mean? And so I then have to like further define it for those folks and say, well, you know, some folks have like autism or Asperger's or they're just, their brains work differently. And so I think when we want to create an inclusive workspace, that's what I think of when I think of diversity. I think of something that's representative of like what your customers might look like. They're gonna be across the board. They're gonna have different genders. They're gonna have different, you know, um, ways that they express their um, sexuality. And they, those things are different, right? And so people just like tend to think only in their network and tend to think only what they're familiar with. And that can be really, really difficult in a work environment where you're trying to build products that generally are for the use of like, Everybody. <laughs> right? Yeah, so I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, you know, I'll go back to something at UPS and UPS was great when it came to diversity, because if you think about the size and scale of UPS as a company, I, half a million employees operating literally in every country on the planet um, and a, a workforce that candidly is to some extent curated from the communities in which they operate. So it's very, very reflective of everything from a gender perspective, from a race and ethnicity perspective, um, physical ability, sexual orientation, 
Um, you know, I remember UPS early stage being one of the really first Fortune 50 companies to offer same-sex partner benefits um, and to offer insurance for um, some of our trans employees, uh, which was a you know a big deal back then. It's still a big deal. A lot of companies don't do it today, um, but it, it was definitely a moment of pride for me. Um, I grew up in Chicago and I went to a high school that was like a small university. It had 5,000 kids. And having grown up prior to high school in the suburbs um, where I grew up was predominantly white. I had not had a lot of exposure till we moved into the city. But entering that school for the first day and looking at this array of people that came from so many different cultures, so many different places, was the most exciting thing to me. And there were clubs for everything. There was the Greek club, the Albanian club, the regular chess club and you know cheerleaders and all of that. I joined every ethnic club that I could, mainly because to your point earlier, I love to eat. I wanted to try their food. Um, but I also got to learn about their culture. And I think that that was part of what curated my love of travel. Like there was nothing that I love more than understanding another culture, how they live. When I travel, I don't like to stay in hotels. I like to rent an apartment, stay in a neighborhood so that I'm understanding truly what life is like in that particular country. And that to me is something that helps with diversity. Um, once you have an understanding of the fact that there are so many different perspectives and backgrounds there. Um, I, I think it rounds you as a person. Absolutely. And I love that you have such a variety of lived experience. And that said, I have a question for you, and that is, who is someone that you think of as a leader like yourself that you think would be a great guest on a podcast like this? Oh, wow. Um, I could give you a whole list, but... Um, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, Boy, there's, I, you know, one person, um, and, and you probably won't know who she is, but there are a couple of beauty influencers and fashion influencers that following the George Floyd thing really stepped up, I think, and embraced diversity, not just in terms of let's show a person of color in our ads, but really tangible actions that their companies are taking. Um, Jen Atkin, who's the founder of Way Hair Care, uh, is one person that I would call out. I think she's done an amazing job. Um, Danielle Bernstein, who is a fashion blogger, has really made an attempt to be more inclusive, both in terms of size and in terms of what the people modeling her clothes actually look like. Um, so those are two people uh, that I would think of. Unfortunately, I don't know either one of them personally uh, to give yeah. you a connection, but they, they've really done a great job. Well, they're on my radar now, so we'll see if we can get them on the program. I'm sure they appreciate the shout out. And of course, they're doing amazing things. So I'd love to have that conversation. So where can we find out more information about your company? This is a great time. Any shameless plugs that you've got for us? Yeah, shameless paid political announcement for myself here. Um, certainly my LinkedIn profile is always a great way to reach me or my company website, which is marketing-mojo.biz. Um, so if you are a brand that is in need of infusing purpose uh, into your operations, especially to make it very appealing from an attraction and retention perspective for Gen Z, uh, I would absolutely love to talk to you. Outstanding. So we'll put that in the show notes so people can find it easily and reach Perfect. out to you. So final and most important question. What are you snacking on lately? What's your favorite snack? <laughs> you know, since we're still sort of quarantined here, I've been snacking on a lot lately, actually far too much. But I have recently discovered a passion for sort of old school candy. Um, so my my obsession these days has been the little miniature baby Ruth's. I probably haven't had those since high school, uh, but my husband came home with a bag of them, Halloween candy time. And if you put them in the refrigerator and eat them cold, they are really, really good. That That is pretty pretty legit. So yeah, I haven't had a baby Ruth in so long, but I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to eat a lot of sugar. So <laughs> it's, it's- Yeah, that's why I eat the little ones. I eat the snack size ones, but I will tell you there's something about that combination of the milk chocolate and the caramel and the salted peanuts that is just working for me these days. 
There is. And then as soon as you said old candy, my brain, I was like, my favorite candy when I was a kid, my family knows this, is Charleston Chews. Ah, Ooh, yeah. What I wouldn't do for a Charleston. Same thing, throw it in the freezer so it gets nice and crisp. And oh, yeah, oh, those man. things are, they're hard when they're frozen, though, but then as they're in your mouth, they sort of melt down. Yeah, yeah we could probably have this conversation all day long. Absolutely. So yeah. thank you again, Lisa, for coming on the program. I appreciate your thoughts. Mike, thanks so much for having me. All right. And for those of you out there listening, please like, subscribe, and uh, become a podcast listener. We love you. The San Diego Code School is a proud sponsor of the Snack Walls Podcast. The San Diego Code School is leading companies to tech equity. The Tech Enabled Apprenticeship Program is a venture whose heart is to do a lot of social good and do good work. You can help San Diego Code School secure funding for change by hiring developers, bringing a team in to relieve your backlog, or becoming a program sponsor. You can visit us on the web for more information at http colon forward slash forward slash sdcs.org.